So good afternoon and welcome to the RAS Rethinking Autonomy and Safety online and final seminar. My name is Laura Ruotsalainen and I will be moderating uh, this event and I come from the University of Helsinki. So this event is, is organized as a wrap up of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and employment funded RAS project. And today we will be hearing exciting presentations, both from the RAS ecosystem and the industrial partners. So we have over 160 registered pass participants for the online event uh, coming all around the world. So mainly from Finland, but also from Ireland, UK, India, Norway, and so on. So before we will get on with the, the great presentation, so some housekeeping uh, information. Uh, so the event will be probably noticed and then the presentations and the recording will be available afterwards. And so everyone except the presenters uh, should keep their mics on. So actually you have been muted. And then also we, we ask you to keep also the videos off to, to save the bandwidth. And due to the uh, time uh, restrictions, so if you have any questions or comments to the presenters, so pr please write those down to the chat and then the presenters will reply you after their presentation. But so th then we can get started with the exciting program and then we will start uh, with the presentation uh, uh, about RAS ecosystem and it will be given by Dr. Hannu Karvonen who works as a senior scientist and ecosystem lead for autonomous systems at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. So he is also currently the coordinator of the Rethinking Autonomy and Safety Ecosystem. So please, Hannu, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Laura. And a warm welcome to our event on my behalf as well to everyone. Great to see so many of you online today. And hope you can see my screen now. So in this presentation, I will shortly go through what exactly RAS is, what kind of activity we have, and also what have our results, achievements and impact been so far. So first, uh, what is this RAS actually? So shortly put, it's an interdisciplinary ecosystem for autonomous systems research, innovation and development. And our main aim in RAS is to help companies and other stakeholders in their innovation activities related to autonomous systems R&D. And in RAS, we have a multi-domain approach in which we look at particularly the application domains of land transport, maritime and drone systems, and also mobile work machines. And these domains have actually quite a lot of uh, similar technologies in use, but also some topics for cross-domain well, for example, safety procedures. And out of these verticals, we actually have separate presentations with some specific examples today later from the other speakers. But yeah, uh, you can find more details about these focus domains and also other information about RAS through our website at autonomous.fi. So then uh, here are the logos of the RAS Finnish partner organizations. So Basically, we have pretty nicely covered the Finnish universities and universities of applied sciences as well, which are involved in this autonomous systems research and education here. And research and development team wise, we have in RAS something called the research task forces or RTFs for short. So there are actually nine of these RTFs and each of them have a dedicated leader with a deputy. And they include also around 20 members each from different RAS partner organizations who are experts in that particular topic. And these thematic groups have actually been identified based on our autonomous systems R&D framework, which we have developed together with other companies and authorities. So uh, as you can see from the list there, we have research groups in RAS related, for example, to autonomous systems, ethical, legal, business, and operational aspects, and also to some relevant technical topics like uh, situation awareness sensors, connectivity solutions, cybersecurity, remote operation and maintenance solutions, and also the use of AI. And of course, these groups have not worked as islands, but instead have also quite much collaborated with each other, as some of these topics are really uh, 
overlapping and they also have similar challenges to a certain extent as well. So then uh, here are some basic facts about the current status of RAS. So the project to ramp up and run the operations of RAS has been funded from 2018 to 2020, partly by TEM, which is the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment of Finland. So basically this project is now drawing to a close by the end of this month. And actually this webinar, like Laura mentioned, is sort of like the final webinar for that project. So our vision from the start of the project already has been to provide this one-stop shop access for all interested stakeholders to top research, development, innovation, expertise in autonomous systems. So based on that, our mission in this field has been to solve especially these systemic and holistic challenges related to autonomous systems to benefit the companies, but also the society at large. And in addition, we have had the education goal of securing the availability of skilled professionals, which I will discuss a bit more later in detail. And there on the right, actually, you can see some numbers about the current status of RAS. So you can notice that uh, we have uh, actually been originally established in 2017 and we ran the ecosystem as voluntary work and then received the external funding in 2018. And since then we have grown to have over 200 researchers involved from those 20 research organizations I showed earlier with the logos. And we also have at the moment 10 international partners and plus 50 industrial collaborators with whom we have, for example, prepared over 10 large new projects during this time. So uh, here you can see some of our concrete ecosystem activities with companies and other organizations. So first of all, we have provided for the company something what we call roundtable sessions, which have been sort of like a one day think tank aimed at different types of organizations to challenges related to autonomous systems. And these sessions can actually be also organized as remote virtual workshops nowadays, to which we have quite good facilitation tools available. Then uh, we have something what we call project accelerator services, which are a relatively short term effort to define the basic concept and consortium for an R&D entity. So you can see from the blue process picture over there that these kind of projects that we develop there can be, for example, well, EU projects and uh, it can be nationally funded projects and other type of network collaboration projects. And the focus of these roundtables uh, or the project accelerator services has been on the consortium and the concept, basic concept for the project. In addition, we have had team specific work like uh, road mapping, for example, the writing of white papers and other joint publications, etc. ongoing. So there's also some industrial partners and international partners who have been involved there. And additionally, we have also aim to be involved in certain type of innovation challenges, which have included startups and SME teams, but also researcher teams as well. And then uh, one big concern, especially here in Finland, uh, but I guess globally as well, has been the securing of the availability of the skilled professionals of autonomous systems for the upcoming years. So therefore we have been building for example a, a doctoral school of industrial innovations uh, for autonomous systems with a special role uh, for each involved university and actually related to this professionals also the need for this kind of re-education of adults and increasing their lifelong learning opportunities are relevant here and they are actually provided for example by the involved universities of applied sciences that we have actively worked or at uh, these uh, at this network training and education offerings related to autonomous systems, relate, related, for example, to drones and maritime systems. Then uh, we have also strived to offer the involved organization possibilities to build these strong links to business relevant test beds, which can be owned, for example, by companies, cities, or research institutes. And the networking and data sharing between these test beds has also been one area where we wanted have wanted to advance the international testing uh, availability as well. Then uh, uh, the involved collaborator companies have gotten obviously visibility in the events we have organized, like high profile seminars and workshops, which have also been organized as online versus like 
this event, for example. And uh, in addition, we have aimed to keep the involved organizations up to date in the quickly developing field of autonomous systems through different means of cross domain benchmarking between the chosen focus domains, for example. And then finally, um, particularly the universities in RAS have provided recruitment, coursework, thesis, and education or training possibilities for the interested organizations. So if you or your organization are actually interested in collaborating with RAS in any of these ways that I mentioned, please just be in contact with me. But then uh, we, if we go to the sort of like the results and numbers that we have achieved during these uh, two years uh, from which we had had uh, the RAS ministry funded project. So we have been keeping track of uh, all this <laughs> and what we have listed here in the periodical reporting to the ministry. And uh, I want to also remind you here that these numbers and statistics only reflect the current situation and probably they will yet increase once we get the reporting finished from our partners after this month. But from those numbers, you can see that uh, uh, during these two years, quite a lot of activity in meeting different stakeholders and promoting grass in various events. So I will just shortly go through them. We have had altogether 173 private meetings with different external stakeholders where we have spread the good news of RAS and also discussed about the collaboration. And secondly, we have represented or one could say even evangelized RAS in total of 97 public seminars and workshops. And thirdly, RAS has been also involved in organizing or taking part in altogether 24 private workshops and invite only events in which our agenda has been promoted. Then uh, until today, uh, we have held 51 different public commercial presentations related to RAS. And well, this number actually doesn't include the presentations of the scientific papers. That's a separate number as well. So I will get back to that later. Also, we have gained almost 40 separate online media hits related to RAS. And at our web pages, there has been 29 news posts during these two years which have also been promoted uh, actively through the RAS social media accounts. But then if we go more concretely to the actual results we have achieved during these two years that we had at the Ministry funding for the project. So here at this slide, we have some points about the publications related to the RAS project. So firstly, for each of these RAS focus domains, meaning the drones, the maritime, the work machines and the road traffic segments, we have produced these future roadmaps for particular year spans, which actually reads all the way to the year 23, uh, 2035. Yeah. So in addition to this task uh, or this work, we have been then examining each of these domain specific roadmaps from the perspective of the nine main research teams that we have had, like the ethics, the business, technology and others that I listed before. So in this way, we have a pretty good overview of foresight about what is to come in different autonomous system sectors and their relevant research and development teams. So if any of you are actually interested in these roadmaps, please just be in contact with me. Uh, then, of course, as most of us in RAS are researchers, uh, we have written quite a lot of related publications. So uh, according to the last count, there has been over 100 scientific publications from us in RAS during the years 2018 to 2020. And you can find a list uh, of some of these from the RAS web pages, but that list actually is going to be updated once we get the, all the publications from our partners put there as well after this final reporting. And then uh, in the RAS, RAS uh, research task forces, we have been actively writing the white papers related to specific teams of these groups. And these include, for example, a white paper about autonomous systems and technology companies business transformation and also about tackling uncertainty in autonomous systems. And uh, yeah, this latter one is going to be soon out fresh of the press. Uh, so watch out for that and I will keep you posted related to all other uh, white papers as well. So there's going to be later some other white papers from operational design and development processes uh, group, from the connectivity group and from the cybersecurity research task force. All right. Uh, 
here we have conducted some analysis of the overall research performance in numbers. So first of all, in the top, uh, we have calculated from the Scopus database of peer-reviewed literature, some statistics based on a group of 25 active RAS researchers. And they clearly show these numbers that between years 28, uh, 2017 and 2019, at least the amount of international and also the amount of academic corporate collaboration has increased in our publications, as you can see from the percentage numbers there. Uh, well, Scopus doesn't have yet the numbers related to 2020 as it's still ongoing, but it will be definitely interesting to see those <laughs> later as well. Then in the bottom, uh, we have calculated from the Juli National Library of Finland database search that, um, well, the amount of Finnish autonomous systems related scientific publications has been on the rise clearly during the last few years. And the last number there is from October 2020. So that number is going to be probably even higher than the one from 2019 eventually. All right. Uh, then some other key achievements, I would say, related to RAS in numbers. So first of all, the number of Finnish RAS members has increased from the initial 10 uh, in 2018 to the current 20 during these two years. And uh, we have also had 10 international research organizations joining RAS since its founding, like I mentioned. And in addition, we have had a dozen of related research and innovation projects accepted from RAS members with over actually 20 million euros in total for the Finnish partners. And this include, for example, several drone related national and international EU projects, which will, I think, at least have a really large impact on that specific area. And well, that area has also been quite, quite clearly on the rise recently here in Finland, but I guess in Europe and globally as well. Also, we have organized over 10 public events. Uh, related to RAS, like the seminars and webinars, like this one, for example, to increase awareness about the autonomous systems in general, but also about the ecosystem. And we have also organized for the companies uh, these facilitated private roundtable workshops about their research development and innovation challenges, altogether 15 of those. And companies who have workshop with us include, for example, large corporations like Carcotec and ABB here in Finland, but also some smaller startups and SMEs like, for instance, uh, Roborite and Rightware here. And uh, some, uh, well, some workshops have also been organized with the public sector, actually. But I think these roundtable sessions have been really wisely uh, working as a way to facilitate new project preparations as well. So. That's been clearly nice achievement. But in addition, we have also had quite active cooperation with the Finnish Innovation Funding and Trade Agency, Business Finland, and the, specifically their smart mobility program. We have held over 10 related meetings with them because actually in the start of the project, they asked us to help to coordinate this kind of large projects related to chosen focus areas of the program. And therefore we have now Act, been actively involved uh, with several RAS members pre in preparing this large national growth project entity, such as, uh, for example, a drone ecosystem project called Rolo, a smart forest related project, and then a smart rail ecosystem project here in Finland. And we have also been working uh, with Business Finland to produce these several brochures for international audiences related, for example, to smart solutions to the maritime and the ports and the aviation sectors as well. Okay, uh, some key impacts um, of the ecosystem work in RAS. So, firstly, especially the Finnish research community's awareness and understanding of the complex impact of autonomous systems in these chosen focus domains has improved. And RAS has helped to formulate this kind of common future outlook within the chosen research teams related to, for example, the ethics and the business and the technical solutions, like I said earlier. And uh, these have been concretized, for example, as roadmaps and white papers, as I said. And 
The second point there refers to the fact that uh, RAS has significantly increased the willingness of these involved research organizations to work together instead of as separate islands. Um, so we have wanted to jointly advance the national important research teams related to autonomous systems. And also actually the educational organizations have actively worked together to develop uh, this kind of jointly offered education programs to increase the availability of skilled professionals. Then thirdly, uh, it can be said that the involved companies have been very satisfied with the service that they have received from RASP related to the roundtables, which have been defining their co-development projects. So, for example, the companies have really appreciated the way to access the related research on a one-stop shop basis, and they have actually could have used this service even more than was possible during this partly TEM-funded project that we have had. And Finally, related to these key impacts, uh, we have had international cooperation by Professor Monchev Gabus with the US National Science Foundation, uh, and uh, that has been conducted through the Center for Visual and Decision Informatics. And in this project, I have to say, there has been really many highly appreciated US research institutes and companies involved in the collaboration. OK, uh, then. Here's a short evaluation, or I would say self-evaluation at the moment, of some of the successes of this ministry-funded for us project, and then a few examples of things that could have been done better, I have to say. So uh, first, on the successes side on the left, we can now say that we have a relevant thematic framework and national expert group in place. And then secondly, the cooperation and expert discussions in the RAS thematic groups have been now started quite successfully, I have to say. And thirdly, it can be stated that RAS has managed to increase this industrial awareness and interest towards autonomous systems. Well, at least based on the fact that we have had quite a considerable number of industrial contact discussions with positive feedback and positive learnings during these past two years. So, fourthly, the point there refers to the fact that we have large uh, ecosystem projects for Business Finland meaning the drone ecosystem, the smart forestry, the smart rail that I mentioned earlier. And the collaboration with this program, well, the, with this Business Finland Smart Mobility program has been really fruitful, I have to say, in other ways as well. And then finally there on the left, uh, the educational networks and the national doctoral school developments have been advancing quite well. And this will ultimately contribute to the availability of experts in the field of autonomous systems. But then, uh, if we look on the right uh, at the things that we could have done better or we could have improved on. So we have there as the first item the point that besides the NSF project mentioned earlier, the international cooperation with large ecosystems has not started as originally planned uh, at that pace. And that would have needed really more focus from our behalf. Uh, but it, has actually been restricted by the needs of our internal collaboration facilitation and also some concrete national project preparations with the companies. They have taken our most of our time at least. But in general, well, we have had a number of international research and company contacts created, also some really big EU projects uh, during this time. And these create a solid base for further international collaboration in the future. Then secondly, there, uh, the road mapping work of RAS could have actually included more collaboration with the related companies in the chosen focus domain. So that would have enabled us to reflect more on the industry's perspectives regarding the development of autonomous systems, specifically in these domains that we have chosen. So that's also one clear <laughs> action point for the future for us. And then thirdly, uh, the internal the internal co cooperation in this innovation ecosystem project preparation and execution, and also in innovation challenge activation with the companies, could have needed more resources in order to have this larger impact. So, one reason for this, uh, I can say that uh, has been the challenge that uh, instead of these kind of hardcore technical experts that we have a lot, <laughs> we would have also needed more sort of these generalists who look at autonomous systems more from the systemic business, legal and operational concept point of view, and who are actually able to lead this kind of large innovation ecosystem preparations with the companies. So that has been clearly one area for improvement. But yeah, 
based on these points about room for improvement in the future, we strive to focus more on the concrete added value and innovation activities for companies and research also at an international level. And I will actually tell more about this in my second presentation today later regarding these RAS future plans. But uh, that's it uh, on my as a tool to ask questions or comments or then you can contact me directly for any inquiries. You can see my contact info there. I can try to use the chat to answer you if possible, but otherwise, thank you. And maybe back to you, Laura. So great, thank you, Hannu. So quite a lot has happened during the, the past few years here. But but yes, a reminder to the audience, so, so please write all your uh, questions and comments to the chat, so Hannu, and, and then after the, the other presentations, the other presenters also are able to, to discuss with you and answer your questions in the chat. But so then we will uh, go on with the program and we will go into the domain specific presentations now and, and we will start with aviation and, and a presentation titled Towards a Digital European Sky. And the presentation will be given by Alain Sieber, who is a chief economist and master planning at CESAR joint undertaking, a European Commission agency. He is responsible for all economic and master planning aspects of CESAR, the EU project geared at digitalizing the infrastructure supporting aviation in Europe. So please, Alain, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues from, uh, from Finland and, uh, and beyond. Uh, thank you for the courage of inviting uh, a bureaucrat from the European Union to this uh, very prestigious um, uh, gathering of, uh, of the research community. Um, a few words um, about, um, about my agency, the CESAR Joint Undertaking. We are an agency of the European Commission uh, dealing with uh, aviation. Actually, in Europe, you have two. You have uh, EASA dealing with regulation and certification of uh, systems and procedures in aviation. Then you have us. Uh, we just care about technology and we like to call ourselves the NASA of Europe, but we are less cool because we don't send uh, people to space. Um, a few words about uh, the, the current focus of the program uh, and uh, the tagline for it is uh, towards a digital European sky. We essentially see that um, uh, we have uh, a need for uh, a lot of work to be done uh, to uh, modernize the uh, infrastructure supporting aviation uh, for it to be fit for the 2020s. Uh, one of the reasons is um, the vehicles that are going to be flying in Europe are going to be different from the ones that have been flying in the past. And the other main reason is, of course, the growing environmental concerns from um, our uh, population. Um, so a few words about the, the, the kind of need. Uh, if you look at the infrastructure supporting everything that flies, it is currently designed to handle at any given point in time about 1000 vehicles in the air, where in most cases you have a, a pilot to talk to. Systems that are in the air, but that have a relatively poor connectivity with the ground and the uh, uh, current uh, COVID crisis that is affecting this sector very hard. But already before even this uh, COVID crisis hit, we could see that the infrastructure was really struggling to be scalable to uh, the demand for access to the sky that is uh, uh, facing, and we see it in particular right now, stronger fluctuations up or down. So there is a problem of scalability. Um, if we look at the future, uh, we see that we will need an infrastructure that is able to handle not thousands of vehicles in the sky, but hundreds of thousands of vehicles in the sky that are going to be more connected and more autonomous vehicles. And they will be flying from very low level altitudes to very high level altitudes. So somehow we see uh, a, a, a demand for greater access 
uh, of the sky with an evolution also of the of the needs for mobility we are talking about potentially you know you've heard about flying cars or urban air mobility and then these uh, growing environmental constraints because we cannot foresee that we are designing for example the next generation of air vehicles that are going to be more autonomous but also more um, um, uh, environmentally friendly and then have an infrastructure that would waste this performance potential of all these uh, vehicles. So the, the vision for, for Europe, we spent uh, about two years really exploring what this would mean for, for the infrastructure, uh, is encapsulated in this um, illustration. Uh, so we are now going to focus on developing and implementing a fully scalable air traffic uh, control system that will rely on strong system integration between the systems that are uh, mobile, so flying, as well as the systems that are on the ground. This will then have to rely on services that today are very manual, but that tomorrow are going to be data services, uh, because essentially we are uh, talking about a system that by large is going to be uh, automated, uh, also from a ground perspective. We see objective to eliminate any environmental inefficiencies caused by aviation infrastructure and making sure that we can fully exploit the potential of the next generation of aircraft that are not going to be only more autonomous, as I said, but also cleaner and quieter. We see significant value at stake if we get this right, just to talk about the environment. Uh, essentially, right now, about 10% of uh, the emissions uh, in Europe due to aviation are caused by inefficiencies in the supporting infrastructure. So the idea would be to eliminate that. And if we would do just to make a comparison, we are actually talking about eradicating the, let's say, yearly CO2 um, uh, emission of a city like Madrid. We will also be able for those that are traveling to um, in a post-COVID world, uh, ensure that there is less waste of time because we will have a much more predictable and reliable system where basically you will be able to spend more time at home or at work uh, instead of um, uh, being on idle at an airport uh, uh, waiting for an airplane to arrive. Um, also, uh, if we if we move towards this kind of digitalization of infrastructure supporting aviation, it is going to open many new um, opportunities for for people and businesses to en enhance uh, the position of Europe as a as a as a digital uh, leader. And lastly, as we as we need one overall flagship motto, we really want to position Europe as the most environmentally friendly sky to fly in the world. This is our overall objective. So. In order to uh, realize this vision, we are actually going to uh, be launching a new program that will be called Digital European Sky next year. And I want to give you a flavor of this. Um, one of our focus areas right now is to be sure that we focus on the right uh, content and uh, it's a research and innovation program. So we will be focusing more on uh, breakthrough technologies and services, what it means for Europe as we are essentially using public money, is that we will have a greater appetite for risk. We will have to push the boundaries in terms of, you know, what can be done through automation um, uh, to help the ecosystem evolve uh, um, on, a, on a kind of pace of change that is uh, going to have to accelerate. Because traditionally in aviation, which is a, a safety critical uh, uh, operation and in particular the infrastructure. We have uh, had uh, innovation like Cyfox of about 30 years and we need to bring it closer to five to ten years. So there is a, a huge change there uh, that we need to facilitate. In terms of topics, there is a topic um, and project that are, we are going to concentrate on air ground integration and autonomy. Um, on autonomy it is uh, unsinkable that uh, we will have um, on board the devices uh, any humans uh, to talk to. Uh, so we need to make sure that all of the, some of the work that the pilots did um, is taken care of by, by robotics and supported by the infrastructure. 
The connectivity of the uh, vehicles uh, between themselves, but also with the infrastructure is a, is a big topic. And for this, we are looking at a much broader range of solutions than the ones that we have in aviation today, which has been developed for aviation for aviation. So we are more looking at what is happening, for instance, in self-driving cars and see how some of that could be applied to aviation. Artificial intelligence applications, virtualization, cyber securing, data sharing, because we are a safety critical infrastructure. We also have um, a fully automated um, uh, traffic control system that we call use space uh, by design for drones. Uh, that we are going to broaden out to applications for passenger transportation with um, urban air mobility all the way into cities. Um, civil military aspects, so I will not go through everything, but a number of points that um, are going to be, I think, very uh, interesting moving forward. Uh, I hope for, for all of you that are interested uh, in these aspects. We are also thinking about uh, now engaging the right partners, so um, we are going to change the way we are organizing ourselves. We will be much more open um, and welcome new entrants to aviation, in particular in emerging uh, areas uh, such as autonomy and connectivity. If I'm very blunt, yes, we are looking for innovative companies uh, in the domain of aviation, but potentially we will have uh, some actors willing to work in these programs that are not coming purely from an aviation background, and we will welcome that. We'll have a stronger engagement of operational stakeholders also. Uh, we will have a so-called network of demonstrators across the European Union to really have, for example, Finland, if I would take an example, as the showcase uh, for uh, the, the, the testing in, in real operational conditions of those new capabilities. But uh, we will be able to have a few of those in a number of EU countries. We'll have a stronger engagement with um, standardization bodies, uh, regulatory authorities in Europe, but also uh, all EU member states are going to be associated. So this will include, uh, for example, Finland. Some example of uh, ecosystem actors that have already expressed their interest to join this program. So in Finland, there is a VTT and we are very happy about this. Also via an alliance, uh, the air navigation service provider of Finland. This is for now as a situation in Finland. And here I'm just focusing at, um, let's say, companies or research centers. Uh, those companies will be working then together with academia that we will stimulate as part of a dedicated exploratory research portfolio of activities. And then you have very known companies like Airbus, um, Honeywell, um, Volocopter, Lilium, Saab, Pipistrel, uh, the research centers for aeronautics in, in Germany, the Netherlands, France, um, uh, companies like Uber, uh, and startups like Zoronik, which is a joint venture between Deutsche Telekom and uh, the German Air Navigation Service product. This is not an exhaustive list, it's just to give you a flavor uh, of the kind of actors that are positioning themselves to join this program. It is not a complete list, the list is published on our website. Uh, so apologies if uh, if not everyone could be on there. We have over 40 actors. Um, this will conclude my presentation. If you are interested in knowing more, uh, please visit our website, uh, cesarjointundertaking.eu. If you are interested in, in our research agenda, uh, it has been published um, uh, recently uh, called Digital European Sky, where you can see more about uh, all of our different uh, research uh, priorities uh, that we are now going to prepare in, and develop into a, a work program uh, as we engage further with potential future partners. That's it, Laura, for me. Uh, thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions by, by chat or if you contact me on LinkedIn uh, or, or per email. Um, I think the easiest is just to contact me on LinkedIn. It's, it's public. Thank you so much and looking forward to uh, further discussions with um, with your ecosystem. So great, thank you, Alan. And I noticed there is already some some questions for you in the chat. So, so after the presentation, please go there and and look at the chat. And I'm I'm sure there will be many new members for your future program <laughs> from the the participants here. So thank you, and and then we will continue with the maritime domain.
and, and the, with the presentation titled Marine Tractor Beam Intelligent Fairways. And the presentation will be given by Jere Laaksonen, who is the CEO of VTT Sense Way. Before entering his position at VTT, he worked at Rolls-Royce, where he became responsible for the world's first autonomous ferry project in 2017. But as said, now at VTT Sense Way, please, the floor is yours, Jere. Thank you, Laura. Very great to be here and thank you for the invitation. It's great to share own vision and concept about the future of maritime autonomy. And uh, yes, I'm from VTT Senseway and a little bit our company. We provide engineering services for companies whose products are aiming to autonomy. And we also have our own product development. And I will show you the the core presentation of our vision, how the maritime environment basically will uh, develop towards the autonomy. Um, before we enter into the specific presentation, I would like to show you the more entertaining video that basically summarizes our ideology uh, about the whole uh, concept that we have been developing. So, but let's have this short video before. Look at him, he's heading for that small moon. I think I can get him before he gets there. He's almost in range. That's it, and that was quite entertaining, but there's a strong message behind. And the message basically is the core idea of, of marine tractor beam that we have been developing and, and how we see the world. And when talking about the, the autonomy and how we should prepare uh, our infrastructure and, 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 and future um, environment for, for future vessels, we have to first imagine um, a chart here um, where we are from the lower left corner to upper right here to the board. We have 20 nautical miles and here is our container vessel that has just arrived from the open sea voyage and is now entering to fairway that is leading to port. But when talking about autonomous vessels, we, we end up very quickly in a situation where, where the pro problems start when you don't anymore have that spacious area where you can uh, make all type of different decisions. And the first thing that we should start concentrating ourselves on is the, how the situational awareness is created for the future vessels. And at the moment, we are in a situation that in the maritime, in short sea areas, we have vessel traffic service providing via the VHF to, to all the actors. But this is always just, uh, can, it's open radio, but basically you are just giving the instructions or, or telling the situation uh, by vocal. And that is not always enough. Then we also have the laser boats and other actors that might have vessels less than 24 meters and they don't have any uh, way to, to tell them, tell their uh, location. And, and our actor here, which is actually manned, uh, manual uh, vessel, traditional ship, is not aware that what's happening there behind the, the islands or, or other obstacles. Of course, they have their own personal awareness created by the vessel centers and the uh, personnel uh, at the bridge. But still, there are many things that, that you are not aware of. And, and this is where we are at the moment. And if you consider this as a, as a machine that would enter to area and it should recognize all the flags and, and lights, all the buoys and other sea marks just through the machine learning, learning through the cameras and things, it's, it's very problematic. So you should first create the interface for the machine. And this is how we see it. So the marine tractor beam basically is a platform that collects all the data from, from uh, data sources. It takes them into the cloud environment, fuses all the targets and provides that shared situational awareness to all stakeholders. And this is something that everything should start from. Yes, we are talking about the specific sea area, 
But for example, VTS in Finland has a very good sensor network already in place, but the information is only provided for themselves. Even though I have to emphasize that a uh, couple of weeks back, the VTS announced that they uh, have launched a development project where they will provide an own data platform where they will share their existing sensor data. For example, for the use of, of marine tractor beam. But we still need an other platform uh, to fuse third party sensors also, because we in the future we are going to have the low Earth orbit satellites providing images and everything. We also have, the, as mentioned earlier, the vessel's own situational awareness, and that data would be very nice to, to uh, fuse uh, in some place and, and share it to all, all actors. This is the first step, the very, very first step. So digitize the existing infrastructure. The next step is only after that you can start building up the applications on top of that data. And this is very remarkable thing. We are not even talking about the autonomous systems yet, but when talking about, for example, traffic management, if you don't have a clear holistic understanding of, of the situations, how you can really make the traffic management. So already, without not talking about the autonomy, we should have this type of um, systems up and running to provide you possibility to make the optimization of traffic. And, and it's, it's man-made, basically, a person-made. So our main actor here, someone from the traffic management, whoever it is, it might be in some areas, harbor captains, or it might be a VTS in this case, they have been dedicated a pre-planned route to the right birthplace and and it's shown visually through the you know, on the bridge system or it can be through the mobile mobile uh, uh, ipads or other other relevant mobile machines how you can provide the information uh, to actors but also we now can we can include the laser boats and some other work boats also to the system and as mentioned earlier the, not all the laser boats have automatic identification systems or, or, or some way how they provide their uh, uh, location. Now, once they have locked into the marine tractor beam, they can provide the exact location and it will be visual to all the others. But let's continue a little bit the story. So, yes, everybody sees that our main actor has here approved, um, approved the route. And now we can start anticipating and predict what's going to happen in the future. And this is very beneficial for all the parties. For example, this is very, very simple situation, confrontation of two container vessels. They both know what, what has to be done. But now all the others also understand that they shouldn't go there in, in between them and understand the, the situations that are going to take place. Of course, we are going to have uh, actors that haven't approved a dedicated route for them, but at least we still know that where they are heading to and they are part of the uh, situational awareness. So the story continues and our actor is continuing uh, the, their journey safely to, to, to that uh, it's dedicated birthplace to board. When talking about the digital systems, it's also very important to understand that when we create this virtual world, virtual environment uh, that uh, mimics the, the real environment, we can start providing new ways of providing the, for example, the shared situational awareness information. So we are only talking about the darkness and the rain. There are still problems with the fog, for example, with the radars and cameras. But if we are talking about the darkness, there are at the moment, multiple cases where someone might not have the AIS system on, uh, on and, and they are doing something silly on the, on the fairway and then the problems start. So it's much more important that some system would recognize all the actors on the area and share that information to everybody. And this is all taking place without including any autonomy into, into the um, uh, discussion. But then, when we enter to the world that the first autonomous vessel would enter to area, it's 
little problematic from the business case point of view that we are a lot of developing the autonomous vessels at the moment. But the business case in most cases will ruin the current business because you have to add so many sensors on top of the vessel. You have to take care of things that uh, typically the crew used to take care of. And we are not talking about the machinery, but more uh, re things related to navigation. So it's very easy to start the autonomy uh, from the open sea, as mentioned earlier. But right away, when you arrive to congested waters, you should have this interface that the machine can log into and actually getting all the targets. And it actually provides another uh, remarkable thing also for the vessel developers that for the first time you can certify the system before even entering to this, um, to this uh, short sea area that is covered by the MTP. Because Marine Tractor understands and, and has uh, noticed all the targets on the area. So now the vessel can verify those targets. There has been a lot of problem, problems discussing that, how to make sure that the vessel will see all the targets in any condition. And, and that will never happen. Of course, there will always be that, that gap. But now by providing the support from the infrastructure, it is possible to even fill that gap and prepare ourselves for the, uh, for the autonomy. And as mentioned earlier in the video, it's, it's quite entertaining, but the core message is very strong. So when you arrive from the deep space, the huge Death Star, and you have all kind of TIE fighters fly, flying no matter where and in front of you, and you, you have no idea where to go. So you have to have a system that connects the vessel and safely escorts inbounding and outbounding uh, vessels to ports. So this is our concept. We are concentrating on these short sea shipping areas. This is how we believe that the maritime uh, development will, will um, go further. And basically, if you want to remember something from the presentation is that MTP acts as a runway for inbounding and outbounding vessels. So. Thank you very much for the attention and, and possibility for the presentation. Thank you. So great. Thank you, Jere. And now, now there's good time for, for you to, to ask the questions in the chat and, and Jere will then reply to you there. So, so now in, in the program, we have a short break of, of five minutes, but actually we have quite well, we are very well ahead of the time. But, but let's have the break now and, and we will continue then, then five paths with, with the following uh, presentations. And meanwhile, you, you can then continue the discussions and, and question asking in the chat. So we will continue five paths uh, too. <laughs> 